But if the cloud until such a time as it did lift, for over the tabernacle a cloud of the Lord rested by day, and the and the fire would apply, appear in it by night, and the view of all of the house of Israel throughout their journeys. And again, this is the ending of the the book of of Shemot. And we did this last night. We'll do it again. We say Chazak, Chazak, Venit, Chazak. Strength, strengthen, let's be strengthened. Chazak, Chazak, Venit, Chazak. Amen. All right, please. Thank you, Yashik Koach. Let's go ahead and stand up for uh, the uh, for the Hagba. Vizot Hatora Asher Samoshe Lifne Bene Israel Al Piadonai Beyad Moshe. And this is a Torah that Moses placed before the children of Israel at the command of the Lord through Moses' hand. Amen. And why do we do this? This was what it says that Ezra showed when he wrote on the scrolls. It says he showed it to the people of Israel. And so this is why we do it. We're following uh, as, uh, the, as how Ezra did it. We're doing amen. Okay. At this time, we're going to have, you may be seated. At this time, we're going to have the haftar. Baruch Hata Adonai Eloheinu Mehelech HaOlam Asher Bachar Bin Vihim Tovihim Vratzab Dimrehem Hanei Marim Behemet Baruch Hata Adonai Abocher Batorah Uv Moshe Avdo Uv Yisrael Amo Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who selected good prophets and was pleased with their words, which were spoken truthfully. Blessed are you, O Lord, who chooses the Torah, your servant Moses, your people Israel, and prophets of truth and righteousness. Amen. Our half Torah this morning comes from 1 Kings chapter 8, uh, verses 10 through 13. When the Kohanim came out of the holy place, the cloud filled the house of Adonai, so that because of the cloud, the Kohanim could not stand up to perform their service. For the glory of Adonai filled the house of Adonai. Shlomo said, Adonai said he would live in thick darkness, but I have built you a magnificent house, a place where you can live forever. Amen. The blessing before the Brit Hadashah. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Natan Lanu Mashiach Yeshua Vahadi Brot Shel Habri HaKadasha Baruch Ata Adonai Noten Habri HaKadasha Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us Messiah Yeshua and the commandments of the new covenant. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the new covenant. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Uh, tonight's Brit Harasha reading will be from Luke uh, chapter 16, verses 10 through 13. One who is faithful in the smallest matters is also faithful in much, and the one unjust in the smallest matters will likewise be unjust in much. So then if you cannot be trusted with unjust wealth, who will trust you with true wealth? Now if you have not been trustworthy with what belongs to another, who can give, anything of, who can give you anything of your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will stick by one and look down on the other. You cannot serve God and money. Amen. Please rise for the Itzchaim. We're just going to keep the ark open. You don't have to. You could just leave it open there. Itzchaim hilamachazikim ba betomchecha Meushar Terracheha Narchenoam Vechon Tiboteha Shalom Ashivenu Adonai Elecha Venachuva Chadesh Chadesh Yamenu Chadesh Yamenu Kedem 
is a tree of life for those who take hold of it, and those who support it are praiseworthy. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Bring us back, Lord, to you, and we shall come and renew our days as of old. You may be seated. Amen. Yasha Koach. Thank you, readers. Uh, there we go. Great. I'm not going to give a full drash. I'm not going to give a full sermon this time because we have out-of-towners here. I drove 20 minutes to get here, but our speaker flew how many hours? Nine hours. So I'm going to make this really quick so y'all can hear him. So we just have, we talked about Piku Day, and there's a couple of things that popped out. A lot of times Piku Day is combined with the previous Parsha, and this year it's not. And there's just a few things that I want to note. One of the things that I want to note is that we, in the, in the Torah Parsha, we t talk about the Mishkan, the Tabernacle. In the Haftar, we talk about the Beit HaMikdash, the Temple. And again, Yeshua, he brings this to fruition to a, a spiritual realm. And he talks, about how, he, he talks about how there's something greater than the physical Temple itself. So we see in the Torah, the Haftar, and the Brit Hadashah, there's, we talk about the Temple, about an abode uh, of, of Hashem, a place for him to, where he could, he could uh, where his Shekhinah, his, uh, his uh, abiding, his presence can be. And one of the things, just a small thing, some people come here, for the, some here for, this, for the conference, some here for a little bit of a spiritual meal. Just a, a small thought that has been going through my mind was we have, we have rumination and we have processing. In Hebrew, we say lalechet means to go, and hitalech uh, means to go back and forth, like to pace. And the children of Israel were not meant to have the Mishkan in perpetuity forever and ever and ever. The Mishkan, the tabernacle, was supposed to be a temporary, uh, a temporary place of worship. And then later, they had the Beit Hamikdash, the temple. And I think something that has been coming up in my mind is sometimes we like to be like the Bnei Israel, the children of Israel, who are wandering in the desert over and over and over and over and over again. Some of us relive our traumas, relive our tragedies over and over and over again to the point where it becomes our identity and we can't get out of that. It becomes our, oh, I went through this when I was little. I went through that. This is, I have to deal with this. And yes, we have to process. Yes, we have to go through these things. Yes, we have, to, uh, we have to deal with it. We can't just ignore tragedy. We can't just ignore trauma. We can't just ignore these things. We do have to process it. We do need time when there's something horrible happening. But some of us are continuously going in that circle. And we're hitalaching. We're going back and forth. We're pacing back and forth. But then we don't actually make it out. So the thing is, look at the, the children of Israel, B'nai Israel. They went back and forth for 40 years. They were with the Mishkan, but then finally they broke through. They made it to the Promised Land, and then eventually they made, they made the Beit HaMikdash a, 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 not a place that was movable. They had this immovable place that's still the center of where we pray to even today. So I think this thing, this, the Torah and the Haftarah, I think that could... That, that really speaks, it was speaking to me it, where we have, we can have rumination where we just go over and over and over and over and over and over the sad things in our life and we're always there, we're always stuck there. Or we could process, we go over and over and over and over and then we go. We finally get out of that. We get out of that rut. And so this is just something, this is not the only interpretation of this Parsha, <laughs> but this is something that was that I, when I was reading through it, this is something that was sticking out to me that was on my heart. Just wanted to share with you tonight. And so, uh, again, thank you for all the readers who were able to help with the, the, the tour service. And thank you for, uh, again, what a, what a beautiful arc. It's making its debut. The Shabbat. Amen. Amen. 
We were just talking about Betzalel, Betzal, uh, who was who was the the constructor of the Mishkan, and he and we we're talking about how he made all these wonderful things. And so here we are. We have our own Betzalel, our own Betzalelim. We have our own Betzalel. Yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, right now, I'm actually going to ask for uh, Mr. Como to come up, Dan Como. He is the, he's a representative of one of the, of a school that's going to be opening up a charter school, and it's going to be focused on Sephardic culture. It's a government, since it'll be government school, he's applying for the charter, they're going through the process right now, they have a, a lot of their board members are here today. They're, because it's a government school, and he'll tell you this, you can't, it can't, if it's government funded, it can't be, uh, particularly theological in nature, but it's still cultural in nature. And he wants to open up, which city? Which city are you wanting to open this up? In? San Antonio. So I'm gonna give a few minutes to Dan to share with us this stream. <laughs> now, this is a 30 minute presentation, but I gotta shrink it way down, hopefully. No, I will. Um, hello everyone, Sh Shabbat Shalom. Um, I just want to give a brief, quick uh, start why I'm here. Oh, wait, this is not it. Yeah, it's the orange one. Um, I, I was in a business transaction in Israel, and I got asked about my heritage. And, you know, I didn't know. <laughs> but my mom's side of the family is Jewish. And, and so, you know, I got in touch with the cousins. And it just went through this whole process. And they're like, oh, yeah. And just kind of went through this whole thing. So there was an awareness in my life about seven years ago where I was opened up to um, the whole understanding of where we came from. And it's been a really neat journey. Uh, my wife and I were involved with some missions down in uh, Central America, which really connected us to the Latino community. Um, I'm gonna, did you find it? So, hopefully you guys can see it. Thanks. Yeah. Did you? Huh? Um, yeah, let me. Okay. Technical difficulties. This is just how it can. Uh, if you could go back and meet him and he'll get to you. This is, I'm telling you, there's been a lot of moving parts in this conference. And I want to get thanks to all those people who have been helping out. There are so many moving parts in this conference, including our fence last night that, uh, that someone who came home from a bar decided, he thought, they thought it was a drive through <laughs> And... Uh, and figured quickly that it wasn't. We weren't serving burgers there and uh, just drove through the fence. But uh, so a lot of moving parts, a lot of different hiccups. But you know what? We're a lot of, a lot of uh, unexpected surprises, but a lot of wonderful surprises as well. There was people that were here that, uh, that I didn't even know were going to come here. So we have a bunch of surprises in this conference, some good. And, and are we ready to go? Wonderful. Once you get once he gets on there, we're gonna go. So if we can have, actually, we're gonna go ahead and pick up offering right now while we're getting that. So we're gonna have just if you have anything you want to donate uh, to to this. I know you guys already uh, uh, paid registration. You don't. By the way, you don't have to pay registration to listen in on these things. But if you want to participate and eat some of the nice food, we have some food for the people out here. But like we have dinner tonight. If you want to take part in. Those fancy things we'd ask you to register. But right now, we're going to go ahead and just pick up the offering. And we have a, a medley here. And go ahead and come up here. Oh, before we do that, Bruce is going to come and pray for the offering. My apologies. Please raise your hand if you would like an envelope. Uh, the scripture I'm going to share this morning is uh, from...
Jeremiah 29, it's verses 11 through 14. For I know the plans that I have in mind for you, declares Adonai, plans for shalom and not calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Then I will be found by you, says Adonai, and I will return you from exile and gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says Adonai. And I will bring you back to the place from which I removed you as captives into exile. Amen. So uh, if you would all please stand with me for the prayer. We come before you, Father, this early morning, Father, this Shabbat morning, to come and glorify you, Lord. Please, Father, bring your blessings upon the speakers, Lord. Fill them, Lord, with your Ruach HaKodesh to speak your words of truth into everybody's hearts, Father. Lord, compel our hearts to come and give joyfully, Lord. Give with, uh, with, uh, with great uh, honor, Lord, and worship to you to, uh, to sow seeds into your kingdom, Father to further, further the good works that you have for us. Lord, uh, please bless this day. And Lord, may this conference, Father, be the beginning of something great, Father, something new that you are doing, Lord. And the Sephardic communities all across the United States, uh, Central and South America, Father, please bless this day. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Oh, and uh, if you have a credit card, uh, you could go to the back. Amen. Thank you so much. By the way, what are the first instruments mentioned in the Bible? It's the kinoa and the ugav. The, it says the, literally the harp, but that's how you say violin in Hebrew, in modern Hebrew. And the ugav. So we got this. It's just very, it's very biblical. Amen. We're going to have Dan Como come up here again. Second time's a charm. That's a good icebreaker. So anyway, I was just saying that um, so about in 2017, I, I basically came to understand and I had an awareness for my history, which has been a great journey. And with us being involved in Central America, in Honduras and um, El Salvador and different places, we were running into quite a few different, um, we ran into a lot of people that had spirit, um, Jewish heritage. And so it really opened the door in 2019. I started working with a charter school here in Florida, I mean in Texas. And next thing you know, we're here. So we founded, so I founded the Diaspora School for Sephardic Heritage. And we put together a team, a leadership team. And I want to say that the, it's the best team I've ever worked with. And I mean, as far as starting and putting together and just seeing what God's put together. But we have a, a wonderful person, uh, Dr. Von Wartz, who has really just been so in instrumental in helping us put things together and go through this process. Usually the application process is three years, two to three years. Uh, within six months, we're already in phase one, uh, going through to the next stage, and which is uh, pretty amazing. So anyway, just want to give you a, a high level overview of what we're doing. Um, and just thank you so much for letting us do this today. Um, oh, this is up to me. <laughs> so our mission, and I'm just going to go through this at a high level. You can read the details if you want. But really, our mission is to 
help awaken others to this, to the understanding of how Sephardic heritage really impacts Texas. At the same time, helping those who have a, a Jewish heritage that maybe not know it, help them to start down that journey of really kind of understanding what that means and what that looks like. Um, you know, and at the same time, we want to be able to offer a very uh, a free quality education, and and so with the state of Texas and the charter, uh, the charter system, we have that ability to do that. And so, um, something that's really important that a lot of people don't know there's there's some key facts, and there's so much history you can find out, but really, almost 25% of Latinos today um, that have Hispanic descent or have Jewish DNA. So there's, there's a lot of people that are working on this, but you know, I've, I've read as many as 200 million um, people that, that could have that DNA that don't understand or that don't know, or maybe not, there's 30% of them that some research has shown that know that, that are trying to figure out what that means. And so what our school wants to do is to be able to, that's where we wanna bring that awareness and help people go down that path to say, hey, this is, this is what it looks like. And so anyway, one of the things that's neat, uh, if you know anything about um, some of the history, but the Sephardic people first started arriving in Texas in the 1500s, in the late 1500s. So there was a Spanish Inquisition. And one of the things that was really unique about the Spanish Inquisition was that the people who were accepting Jesus and the, the idea of the church, it was the people who kept their Jewish heritage were the ones that were really persecuted. So there were people that were accepting Jesus, but then they kept Shabbat, they kept davening, they kept doing things, and that went against the, um, really the, the whole idea of what they were trying to do was to try to pull people away from that. But the people that really suffered during that time were the people who kept their Jewish heritage. And so San Antonio, actually San Antonio was a key place when, when, they, would, um, when they would bring people from Spain here they would go through here. And about 500 miles south of here was a Inquisition court. And actually something that was really kind of cool was that we found out, it wasn't cool, but in the late 1900s, there was still an Inquisition court until uh, the early 1900s. So it's not that long ago. So um, why we're here, I, I just want to, or where we're serving, we've applied in 13 school districts. So ISDs here in San Antonio. So right now we're, we're gonna be going to do an interview with them, uh, with the Texas Education Agency, and they'll take us to the next stage. We, we know we're gonna succeed and go forward in, in setting this up, but um, right now we've, we've started with San Antonio. Um, why choose us? Well, because we have the team to, to do this. <laughs> it's really God's put it, put it together, but the, some of the things about this is that uh, we have smaller class sizes, 17 to one ratio, we uh, capitalize on the, um, on the critical point uh, of the, the development of a child, and we're also teaching Spanish, Latin, Ladino, and Hebrew. So those are some key things just from kindergarten or pre-K all the way to fifth grade. Uh, we're integrating, integrating this all into our curriculum, uh, which is really cool. <laughs> and so, and we're gonna be year-round, which is awesome. So right now, why, you know, um, back here, the competitive curriculum. Um, one of the things is there's a standard that we have to meet and we're gonna exceed that. And so um, there's some things that are really, you know, as far as the education system in, in the United States, we're not even in the top 10. So what we wanna do is help bring that up. And so one of the things is we plan to improve student learning in the pre-K um, just with fundamental math and literacy. Uh, we want to capitalize on um, some of the critical uh, periods of the child's development. And, and I mean, if you may not know, if a child doesn't know how to pick up a crown when they go into pre-K, they're at a huge disadvantage. And that there's a lot of kids like that. And when we, we have a mentor school, they, you know, they, they told us things like, what well, you're going to have to prepare for is, <laughs> it really touches me, but having a kid come in and their parent commit suicide. There's different things that, you know, as a school, your team has to really um, hit on. And there's, there's some of these things that really touch me because I've been a part of situations and seeing that. And, you know, so it's the kids need help. 
they really need help. And this is a great opportunity for us to come in and to actually bring a Sephardic heritage and, and help people understand how, how that ties, you know, here in Texas. But there's, there's uh, four, you know, I've heard all kinds of studies, but one thing it really reached out, or pointed out was a professor in Dallas who said, you know, there's four dialects of Span uh, Spanish here in San Antonio, and all of them come from Ladino, which was the language that Sephardic spoke when they came here. So it just shows you some of the really strong roots that, um, w where it comes from. Um, you know, and, you know, just a couple other things on here. You know, we're committed to creating that atmosphere and helping, um, just helping bring it all together and, you know, and just really give the students an opportunity to build, you know, to build that bridge. And so just in, uh, there's just a couple more things here. Our, you know, our school, school is also, we're joining with other nonprofits that have, that share in the same, um, you know, the, the same vision. One of them, uh, Casa Elite, which is a new nonprofit here in the area, and they want to help bring the culture back. It's a non-religious organization, but want to help try to bring this, the, the, just the Sephardic culture back to here in San Antonio, and they're planning on doing some, some fundraisers and some things to do that. Um, but in summary, you know, we just believe every child, you know, has the potential to make a huge difference in this world. We've seen it tap into their brilliance. And the other side of it is we just want to help bring that culture. We want to open it to, you know, all people. So. Thank you. We are on the cutting edge of something great. Understand this. Dr. Scythe and Barry had this vision some time ago, and it exploded within their being. Just a few a couple of years ago, I was with them, one of the most on the stage with them, one of the mega pastors in the city that reaches night to honor Israel. He leaned over and squeezed my knee. He says, The sleeping giant is a safari. It calls into their, it lights up their, their, uh, all, all the calling to come in. It's, it's, it lights it up like a, like a Christmas, like a Hanukkah bush. Okay? But I'll tell you what, I was going to say Christian, but like a Hanukkah bush, but I'll tell you something. This is exciting you all. The city of San Antonio and Rabbi Baruch prayed for the first time in Hebrew and English, Spanish, and Ladino with the city council. We met with Governor Abbott. He was supposed to be here, but he couldn't because there was a conflict. And he recognized, he's going to recognize this congregation as the Sephardic community in Texas. This is, it gets even better than that. I was notified by the National Historic Foundation that 0.5 miles from the Salado Creek, a guy named Josef Hebner, Josef Hebner was an Austrian Jew that married a Christian. They came to San Antonio and established a synagogue and a church because they believed in Yeshua. 0.5 miles from Salados Creek is right here. This spot. And they're going to declare it as a historical national place. Yeah. <laughs> We're on the cutting edge of something great. It comes a revival of pointing people to their roots, celebrating Shabbat, but pointing it to our Messiah. Can you praise the Lord? Thank you so much. Dr. Seif, thank you so much for grasping this vision. Thank you. We have this service, then we have lunch. After lunch, we have a bunch of speakers. I don't want, I know this is a lot. If you have, we have, I'm calling them, but they're more like, uh, they're, they're lightning rounds because everyone wants uh, everyone sh wants to and should speak three or four hours, but they only have 25 minutes. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to call on the people and just uh, say real quick their, their, uh, their times. Rabbi Manny Rodriguez, I don't think he's here right now, but he's going to be here at 1.30. And so he's going to kick it off. Then at 2 o'clock is Rabbi Eduardo Arroyo. No, can you tell me what, real quick, uh, um, if you're a speaker, can you come up here real quick? I just want you to say the title of your talk and what it's going to be about. So if you're one of the speakers, come up here. And again, not all the speakers are present right now. Yeah, go ahead. 
Hey, Shabbat Shalom. Um, I'm going to be speaking on the Tinoch. Sh- yeah. yeah, my name is Rabbi Eduardo Arroyo. Thank you, Rabbi Roy. Shabbat Shalom. I'm going to be speaking on Tinoch Shanishba, this uh, halakhic category within rabbinic literature of a Jewish child raised in captivity. And we're going to be engaging with rabbinic texts and thinking about how it should inform our Messianic Jewish understanding of the reincorporation of the banana seam into normative Messianic Jewish community. Wonderful. Amen. So we're planning that for him to talk at 2 o'clock. Again, he gets, if you want to know anyone that knows about rabbinic Judaism, what it has to do with uh, the Messianic community, you, you need to talk to that guy. He knows, he knows a lot. It's going to be at 2.30. Rabbi Yosef, can you talk about your, your, tell us a little bit about your talk? Yeah, do something more practical. Once you think or discover what your Jewish roots are, uh, todo el mundo aquí entiende inglés. O necesito un poquito de traducción. Ok. Si hay gente que están descubriendo sus raíces judías, pero ¿cómo es que una persona se puede averiguar que de veras, porque hay mucha gente que han encontrado un, su apellido y aparece que es un apellido judío, pero posiblemente tú no tienes raíces judías. So, well, I'm going to try to speak in Spanish and English in 25 minutes. Imposible. But a lot of people start on this journey of discovering Jewish roots. So I can help you find on the internet, there are many sites that help you discover. They have all kinds of genealogical records that you could, for free, gratis, sin pagar. And you can uh, find, like, on these particular databases to further confirm whether you actually have Jewish roots. And then there are paid services, and they're particularly helpful where you can submit your DNA, and then you can definitely find out if you have Jewish roots. Y también hay lugares hay que pagar para saber si tú Una persona tiene su ADN judía. Como yo, yo encontré, yo descubrí. I'm Ashkenazi all the way, pero hace como 500 años que tengo mis raíces judías y yo soy 3, 3% colombiano también. Qué cosa. <laughs> Thank you. Rabbi Yosef, he's going to be at two thought of Safar Heritage. We're like I said, we're all coming from different different paths, right? Some of us are Sephardic, some are Ashkenazi, some of us are not. Uh, some of the people here are not Jewish at all. It doesn't matter. We're all one in Messiah. Amen. One in Messiah. Amen. Uh, we're going to have uh, then at so it's two thirty uh, at three o'clock. Rabbi Joey Ben Ami. This. Uh, Yes, uh, so I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about what if we don't return? What contributions will be amiss in Judaism, in Israel, uh, in general, and in the Messianic movement if we do not return? And what I'm going to, I'm going to illustrate it by sharing with you a little bit of what my um, dissertation research is for my PhD, that it's an area that it's lacking, even in Israel, even in Judaism, in a way, a particular way to study the Torah. So I'm going to share that with you. Uh, I think you're going to be blessed. Amen. Then, thank you, Rabbi Joey. Rabbi Joey, he's getting his PhD. We're at 3.30 is Rabbi Gil Moreno. He's our, uh, our Sephardic uh, rabbi. He, spe- he teaches in... In, uh, he, in Spanish and in English. Shabbat shalom, everyone. I'll be speaking on the history of the Jews of Texas. So um, not all of it, because there's so much to it, but at least a portion of it, and also a uh, comparison between the Sephardim and also the Ashkenazi. So uh, there's a lot of different points that I'll be bringing up. Amen. 
Amen. And then we're going to have uh, Rabbi, so it's Rabbi Gil Moreno at 3.30, Rabbi Rich Nickel at 4. Where's, where's the rabbi? Yeah, what I want to be talking uh, with you about this afternoon is how to build for our great-grandchildren. Okay? Because it's easy to be excited about something new. But the question is, how do we build wisely and wisely together for the sake of future generations? That's my thrust, and I hope you'll uh, enjoy it. Thank you. Amen. Rabbi, so it's at 4 o'clock, will be Rabbi Nickel. Rabbi 4, uh, at, Rabbi 4.30. At 4.30, we're going to have Rabbi William Ferrer. Y él uh, va a hablar en español para los hispanohablantes. Shabbat shalom lechulam. Buenas noches. Buenas shabbat shabbat para todos. Uh, voy a hablar acerca del ADN no es suficiente. Si no enseñamos tradición, cultura, lengua, comida y cánticos. <laughs> Espero que se gocen. Perfecto. Gracias. 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 Y at five at five o'clock we're gonna have someone a, a video from uh, Rabbi Joseph Shulam. Uh, Shalom from Israel, and he's not here in person, but we're going to be playing that. And then we're going to close out with Rabbi Tony Arroyo. Arroyo. So I'm going to speak about the Anusim from a little island in the Caribbean known as Puerto Rico, and what, how, how from that um, heritage. I discovered my journey and tell you a little bit about what the journey's been like for the last 30 some years. Rabbi, how long have we known each other? We have known each other since 1993. Wow, I was just a baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw, I've been talking with Rabbi Tony along with Dr. Seif. Uh, and uh, Mateus also for uh, many months, and so it's been really wonderful to have him on the team uh, of, of organizing this and getting their, their, the fire. He has a lot of fire in him, and uh, we're going to see if we could spread some of, uh, some of his fire. I mean, all these things are going to be online at concefera.org where you registered. We have the speakers listed there, and then we're going to have a coffee break. Then we're going to have Havdalah, a traditional Havdalah. Uh, then a kosher style. I put that in, you know, kosher style, just no pork. <laughs> there's no, there's no mashkiach there looking over all, everything to make sure it's slaughtered pro properly. We don't have the budget for that unless y'all wanted $200 uh, registration fees. It's kosher style. So it's going to be there. We're going to have it uh, here. We're going to be eating it here. So it's barbecue. You're in Texas, so we're gonna have, we're gonna have barbecue. Amen. And then tomorrow we're gonna be having a screening in this room from 9:30 to 10:30 called "A Long Journey: The Hidden Jews of the Southwest." And so that's at 9:30 a.m. tomorrow. And then we're gonna have a joint service with Emmanuel Worship Center. And Dr. Seif is gonna be speaking once again tomorrow to our. It's a, it's a church. It is not a Messianic congregation, but they are our, a sister congregation of us. And so we're going to be joining with them. And then at around noon, we're shooting at around noon. We're all going to go downtown, go to the Riverwalk, get to know one another. It's going to be, we're going to have a, the shuttle. The shuttle can seat some people. And then we're going to, if we have more people, we'll be carpooling. And we'll go downtown tomorrow. Everything is online, but I just want to let you guys know there's a lot of stuff happening. Uh, you can, if you register, basically that covers the food. <laughs> so if you, don't if you don't register, then, you know, you could, uh, there's a subway down the street. <laughs> <laughs> you, you could go get it and then come back and eat with us because I have enough for that. Or, or, or you could wait around and see if we have leftovers. Uh, <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure they'll be fine. We are going to, again, everything's on concefra.org. This is not happening all the time. Please invite your friends. Like I said last night, invite your enemies. 
Yeah, everyone who, who, who is interested to come in here, it's not too late to be a part of this. We're going to have our speaker, our main speaker, again, who flew. He mentioned it's just really wonderful. He flew with his wife, Tatiana, all the way from Brazil. And it is just, there's something in the water in Brazil. I don't know what there is. It's just everyone is, every time I look at, at something big happening in the Messianic movement, or is it, you look, Brazil, Brazil. There's just something happening there. There's this, a video, look up there, this singing Yeshua, Yeshua. It's just this huge uh, soccer stadium, it looks like. And then we also have, there was one of the biggest, one of the biggest marches uh, for, for, you know, Praying, again, we pray for the end of the war in Israel. We pray for it. Shalom, shalom, Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And we saw people in Brazil supporting that. And so there's something going on there. But I do not know Mateus as well as Dr. Seif does. So Dr. Seif is going to give a much clearer introduction to Mateus's wonderful work. Let's give it up for Baruch, by the way. Thank you. Uh, Rabbi Baruch is one of my heroes. I, I came to this conference with my notebook. I want to learn, not just speak. And uh, I'm looking forward with a pen in hand. Because I think adult, uh, uh, you know, the Lord's using this man in a great way. I'd like to introduce my friend and mentor, Rabbi. Please come, if you will, Matthias. Well, thank you, Dr. Saif, and thank you, Rabbi Baruch, Rabbi Roy, the Garcia family, uh, honorable rabbis, leaders, members of this congregation, visitors. Thank you so much for receiving myself and my wife. Uh, for me, it's a great privilege to be here among such bright scholars and researchers and theologians. You know, I'm far from being as bright as they are, but I'll try to, in this next 45 minutes, maybe 40 minutes, I will do my best to show you part of this phenomena. Because it is a phenomena. It is, it is a revolution. What is going on for the last 15, 25 years, it's a revolution. It's a revolution that will impact the world. It's a revolution that is being guided and promoted by God himself. God is restoring Israel. The promises and the prophecies about the restoration of Israel are being fulfilled right in front of our eyes. And the restoration of the Anusim, of the Sfardim, is part of the restoration of Israel. There is no restoration of Israel without the restoration of the Sfardim. Without the returning of the Sfardim, there is no restoration of Israel. And I'll tell you what. Without the restoration of Israel, there's no coming of Yeshua. Yeshua will only come when Israel restored will receive him as king. He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you will not see me again until you say, Baruch Abba Beshim Adonai. So he must be welcomed as a king in order to come back. By Israel, by his people. And we are part of Israel. The Sephardim is are part of Israel, and their return and their restoration is part of this. Impressed to know about the history of the Sephardim here in, in, in southern uh, United States. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. But I'll be showing you here, and I will set, I set up my timer here so I will not uh, go beyond time. Uh, I'll be showing here about what's going on s south of the equator, okay? I'll tell you about the part of the history that you might not, maybe you not, do not know. But I think it's interesting for you to get to know because you are part of it. You're part of it, okay? So what, whatever I'm, sh I'm going to show you here, you are part of it. Don't consider yourself a part. You are a part of it. So, uh, I'll be speaking about the phenomena of the Anusim and the work of Abrajim. I'll tell you what is it. And Ensinando de Sion, it's the name of our ministry, Teaching from Zion. It's the name of the ministry in Brazil. So, uh, I'm Mateus, like Dr. Saif said. 
I'm now the uh, president of this ministry founded by my father, Rabbi Marcelo. I'm the leader of the Synagogue Hartzion, director of the museum that I'll be showing you and explaining you about its work now. I'm director of Nitiv International. It's a messianic Jewish work from Israel, which has a branch here in the States. And I'm the regional director for Spanish and Portuguese speaking congregations for the UMJC. So uh, let me start uh, quoting a, a, a phrase that I heard from Rabbi in Israel in 2011. I was there for the Netanya College. They had a conference about the Anusim. And Rabbi Lau, which was the former chief rabbi of Israel, former chief rabbi of Tel Aviv, and now is the chairman of Yad Vashem, he opened up the conference saying this, we cannot blame the Anusim for have chosen life. It's our responsibility as Jews to bring them back. That's what he said. And he even quoted Maimonides. Maimonides wrote a very polemical letter called Igeret Hashmad, the letter of the um, uh, traitors, let's say like this, where he advocates for a Jew to convert to Islam to save his life. It's okay to convert to Islam in order to save your life. It's a very controversial document, but Rabbi Lau mentioned this document to justify the, 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 the act, the, the, the uh, decision of thousands of thousands of Jews, Jewish people that chose life, that chose to convert in order to keep their family alive and their business and their way of life. So, uh, this is a very important uh, uh, premise for us to start our session here. So, uh, let's talk about some of the history of the Jews uh, that came to Brazil and how the Inquisition started. I will be really quick about this. So, King Solomon, Spain and Portugal, they were already uh, been visited by Israelites from the time of King Solomon. So the Jewish presence in, in the I, 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 Iberian Peninsula does not date from the uh, Roman time. It's before that. So we have mentioned here in Second Chronicles 9 about uh, King Solomon making business with uh, King Hiram or Tarshish. Tarshish, some scholars say that uh, is a word for that region in, in Spain. So during the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70, Jews went to the Iberian Peninsula where there was already a Jewish community there, and Paul mentions his desire to go to Spain, as you all know from Romans chapter 15, uh, verse 24 and 28. And the presence of Jews in Portugal and Spain was the largest in the world in the 15th and 17th century. It's called the golden era of Judaism. You all know that. Great scholars, uh, great um, uh, 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 scientists, the uh, uh, Scholarly Sagres, the School of Navigation worldwide known in, in Portugal was all run by Jews. Uh, the uh, oldest uh, universities in the world, uh, aside from Italy, was in Portugal, the University of Coimbra. Most of the staff there, professors, were all Jews. So the Jews flourished in Spain and Portugal even during the Muslim uh, occupation. So, but in 1492, as you all know, I'm not retelling here things that you already know, the Catholic kings, uh, monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella, uh, they got the papal, the, the Pope's bull, Sixtus IV, uh, and they expelled, uh, they say that it was something more from Isabella. She was really anti-Semitic and inspired and coached by Torquemada, May his name be erased forever. Uh, they decided to expel all the Jews from Spain, uh, and they made a decree of Alhambria, which is uh, on the 31st of March of, of, of 1492. Uh, they gave the Jews a um, little more than three months to expel, and the day, uh, the due date was Tisha B'Av, 1492. The, the, um, the decree was from March 31st, but the, the end date was uh, Tisha B'Av. Yeah. So, uh, what happened? 1,000 
hundred Jews from Spain, they just crossed the border to Portugal, which was the easiest way to get out. Okay, so uh, this is a, a map here that all these this, uh, black dots show Jewish communities in the Iberian Peninsula, all the black dots, okay? Established Jewish communities. And you have here, uh, where is the laser? Oh, here. In 1492, you have here numbers of Jews that went from Spain. So 100,000 crossed the border to Portugal, 90,000 went to Turkey, Holland, 25,000, Morocco, 20,000, France, 10,000, Italy, 10,000, that's uh, the origin of, of my family. My family came from Italy, from the kingdom, to the kingdom of Livorno. The king of Livorno in Italy gave freedom of religion to Jews in the 16th century. Uh, so, uh, the, those that were killed trying to expate 20,000, and uh, those that were baptized and converted to Catholicism, 50,000. This is an approximate number. So you see that Spain and Portugal, they were, they, the scholars say that 25 to 30 percent of the population were Jews. And they were quite integrated. So what happened? But these Jews that crossed the border to Portugal, their freedom didn't last much. Because on December, December 24th, 1496, King Manuel I from Portugal married the princess of Castela. The, the, the kingdoms reunited Portugal and Spain, and the laws of the Inquisition were now valid in Portugal. So Portugal at first did not expel the Jews. Dom Manuel was a little bit smarter than Ferdinand. He said, you know what? I'm not going to lose all the Jews of my country, of my kingdom. Because they're the professors, they're the, the, the bankers. They're, at this time, Jews had already developed the banking system in Spain. So uh, they, were the they were the financiers of the navigation, the exploration, you know. Most, the most famous captains, they were all uh, Jews. So he decided to first tax, impose high taxes to Jews. And then he promoted the... Um, a mass conversion, a mass conversion by force, by sprinkling water on them and giving them new names. It was, it was done in the um, um, Easter Sunday of uh, uh, 1502, a mass conversion of Jews in Lisbon. You know, thousands and thousands were just, uh, they were baptized standing. Batizados em pé, the way you call it in uh, Portuguese. So, um, what happened was that the, as a result, those that converted, they needed to be watched. You need to understand that the Inquisition was not formed by the Catholic Church to persecute Jews. No, no. The Inquisition was established to prosecute and those who had those Jews that who had converted to, to Catholicism and were keeping Judaism in a secret. They were called new Christians. In, oppose, in opposite to old Christians, they were now new Christians or uh, Maranos is a pejorative term that uh, they also used. So the Inquisition was established to, to watch and persecute these um, new Catholics that were keeping some Jewish traditions inside their houses and teaching Jewish traditions to their children, okay? So, you have here a painting from, from Bernard Picard. It's an artist that uh, painted some scenes of the Inquisition, and that's in the uh, uh, Commerce Square in Lisbon, and uh, you, you see here an auto de fe, Auto de Fe was the public execution and burning on stake of the condemned by the uh, Inquisition. But something happened in spring of 1500. In the year uh, 1500, on April, 
a captain from Belmonte in Portugal named Pedro Cabral asked permission from the king to have a, a fleet with 13 ships in order to go to India, but his real intention was to find land that were already discovered by the French and the Dutch, and he would like to check that. And this captain called Cabral, he was a new Christian, he was a converso. His, all his family were, were, were Jews, and he was trying to find a way for Jews in Portugal to escape persecution by, find, by finding a new land south of the equator. And uh, so he took his fleet, and among the fleet there were famous Jewish navigators such as Gaspar Lemos and Fernando de Noronha, or de la Ronha, uh, and they were great figures in the colonization of Brazil. So, but the new Christian Fernando de Noronha came to Brazil to plant sugarcane and export to Portugal and Europe, and the number of new Christians in Brazil increased significantly. Why? Because once the news arrived in Portugal that Cabral found new land for the king of Portugal, and Cabral demanded workforce, so many of the new Christians to, uh, to escape persecution volunteered to come to Brazil and explore and work on the new land. Thousands and thousands and thousands of Jewish Portuguese people came to Brazil. The first colonizers of Brazil, 90% were all Jews. The first families that came, the first cities where they were established, they were all uh, new Christians. And once they got here, they went back to Judaism. And after some decades, that caught the attention of the, the church, and the church sent uh, to Brazil in 1591, 91 years later, the church sent the first inquisidor to Brazil to find out what was going on. And uh, thousands of Brazilian Anusim were convicted, convicted by the Portuguese Inquisition and they were deported from Brazil to Portugal to be executed and, and, and went to court because the, the, the Inquisition had no courts in Brazil. It could arrest someone, but the person needs to be sent to Lisbon and the trial and the execution would be done there. But during 1640 to 1654, something happened in Brazil. Very interesting. The Dutch took control of part of the northeast of Brazil. And once the Dutch took control of that region, they gave freedom of religion. So many of the Portuguese and Spanish Jews that went to Holland, they now went to Brazil to establish themselves in the new land under freedom of religion. So a lot of Portuguese also came, and when they were in Brazil, they established the first synagogue of the Americas, the first synagogue of the continent. It was established in the city that they established called Recife, the Dutch, you know. And, uh, and they sent from Holland to Brazil the first rabbi of the Americas. Let me show you. This is the first synagogue of the Americas. It's called Tzur Israel, Rock of Israel. It was founded in 1648. And it was, today is a museum you can visit when, when you go to Brazil. You visit Recife and then you go to my city and visit our congregation and the museum. But you will find amazing uh, things there in the synagogue. And this is the rabbi that they sent to uh, coordinate the work of the Synagogue Rabbi Yitzhak Abu Abda Fonseca. You see that the last names are typical Portuguese last names. These were not, Fonseca was not an Anusim. He was not a converso. He was a Jew. His parents were forced to converse, convert to Catholicism. And when they were in Holland, they went back to the Jewish religion. So Fonseca was raised in a Jewish home again. Fonseca was important because he presided the Beit Din that excommunicated Baruch Spinoza. So he's a well-known figure, you know. And he's, he, 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 he presided the synagogue here, and he, he went back to Holland and died in Holland, and we visit his tombstone there. There's still today you can see many tombstones of the uh, Jewish cemetery in Oderkerk, Oderkerk in Amsterdam. They have Portuguese names till today, 500 years later. 
But what happened? When they, f I want to show you this really short. These are the names of the founders of this first synagogue of the Americas, Sur Israel. Look at the names of the Jews that founded the first synagogue in Recife. Look at the typical names. Burgos Diaz, eh, Abendana, eh, Dormindo, eh, Faru, Cardoso, Drago, Aboab, eh, Aguilar, Coronel, Lafaya, Cohen, Faro, Coelho, Correia, Azevedo, Costa, Brasilai, Hamburgo, Castro, Brasilai, Nehemiah, Gabay, De Fuentes, Bom Dia, Joseph de Mercado. These are all Jews. I'm not talking about conversos, Anusim here. These are Jews, Portuguese Jews. They were in Brazil and participated on the uh, establishing of the first synagogue. We have a misconception, and, and unfortunately, inside the Jewish community, that only well-known European, Polish, German names resembles Jewishness. And that's completely wrong. That's completely wrong. So these are typical names of Portuguese Brazilian Jews, and um, but their happiness was short. Portugal took control of the region again and expelled all the Jews that had come to that region. So the Jews had three options that were in Brazil. Either they leave or they convert or they remain, but they have to move Southern. So what happened? Some 23, 25 Jews, they uh, got in a ship from Recife, Brazil, and then went up, and they arrived in New Amsterdam, and they founded the first Jewish community of New York. The first, first Jews that got to New York and established a community were the families from Brazil, were Brazilian Jews. Okay, and you have a museum in New York that tells this history. The oldest synagogue of the United States is in New York, and it's a Portuguese synagogue. You can visit it until today. I was there, I was there uh, just before the pandemic. I was there. I visited the synagogue. I introduced myself. I sent an email to the rabbi, to the chazan there. I said, I'm a director of the Museum of the Inquisition. I would like to visit your museum. They have a museum also in, inside the synagogue. So... They received us. I showed them my work, the work of my father. They were amazed. The rabbi called the Angel, Rabbi Angel, Yitzhak Angel. The rabbi was amazed. The chazan was amazed. We talked for hours. He gave, they gave us materials. We gave them materials. We exchanged experiences. On the following day, I was in New York for a conference. I got an email. It was the Hazan. But this time he was cursing me in all kinds of different Hebrew curses you can imagine. Because he had found out that I'm not only the director of the museum, I'm also a Jewish disciple of Yeshua. And that, a personal belief, ruined everything, all the relationship. Not, my, not what I do, not what I say, no, no. What I believe became the division point. It, it became a wall. Okay? So uh, today I cannot enter the synagogue anymore, but I took a lot of pictures and videos, so it's okay. Uh, so some Jews went north, um, uh, to North America, uh, some went back to Holland, and the majority just migrated south. Okay? Escaping from the Inquisition. And they went to the state of Minas Gerais, which is uh, the state where I live, and is a, a, a famous for the extraction of uh, precious stones, gold, silver, diamonds, emeralds. Uh, so these, these Jewish families went south, and they worked on the extraction of these precious stones. 
And uh, so this is a very interesting uh, chart. This is the list of the first Jews from Brazil that were executed by the court of the Inquisition in Lisbon from 1644 to 1748. These are Jews condemned and burned on the stake for the crime of Judaism. Take a look at their last names. Gaspar Gomes, José de Lis, Teodoro da Costa, Rodrigo Álvarez, João Dique de Souza, Teresa Paz de Jesus, Félix Nunes de Miranda, Miguel de Valladolid, Guilmar Nunes, Diogo Correia do Vale, Domingo Nunes, Luiz Miguel de Correia, Fernando Henrique Alves, Manuel da Costa Ribeiro, Luiz Mendes Sá, Antônio José da Silva. This was a very famous, um, um, he writes plays for, for drama, theater. This, this uh, Antonio José da Silva. There is a movie in Portugal about his life. And João Henriques. So this is the first Jews uh, from Brazil executed by the Inquisition. Well, so let's stop talking about history. Let's talk about the president, present and especially about the future. That's, that's what is important, right? So, what, what do we do with all this information? What do we do with all this information? Are we going to just study about it, write books about it, you know? So, my family, because part of my family is from Anusim heritage, when we found out about all this thing, when we found out about this history, when we found out that according to historians, 20% of Brazilian population today has some Jewish blood. And remember that we have today, how many? 220 million people. Okay, amazing. And that's, that's the low estimative. That's not even the medium. Of the, that's the lowest estimate. Let's say 5%. Huh? 5%. So, when we came across this data, my father said, I cannot, I cannot just sit in my chair. I have to do something. I have to help others to rediscover and to restore this heritage. Because I believe this is part of the restoration of Israel. I need to help these people. Because what was happening is that the, the, these people, they were uh, knowing about their heritage. They were knowing about documents. They were getting in touch with documents, with old birth certificates, with uh, Inquisition trials. And then they, they looked for their local rabbi. And they didn't know anything about it. Zero. And the person would say, would, would, would show how, her, how his relatives and, and forefathers suffered. And now the person wants to be recognized again. The person wants to restore the Jewish identity. The person doesn't know anything. He was not raised in a Jewish traditional home. Didn't, didn't go to a, to a traditional Hebrew school. But the person wants to reconnect. And what was the answer? You tell me, what, what is the answer? Typical until today. Oh, uh, no, first go home, right? Go home. You don't need to come. Go home. Then you come there the second time. Go home again, okay? If you show up a third time, you say, okay, let's talk. You know, what do you need? What do you want? Oh, I have some Jewish blood. These are my family history. This is my genealogy. These are my uh, 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 relatives that were condemned by the Inquisition for being Jews. Okay, okay, we don't need any of that. You want to become Jew? You know, we have a conversion course. It's about three years. You go through this process, and then we will see what happens before the Beit Din. So he said, that's not justice. Israel is not making justice to the history of these people. So we found that my father established the association called Abradin. Abradin in Portuguese is an acronym for Brazilian Association of Jewish Descendants from the Inquisition period. 
And that association collected books, collected last names, collected history, collected artifacts, collected um, 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 family history, traditions, culture, everything you can imagine. And we put it to serve those that want to know more and reconnect to their Jewish roots. So Abrajin's main purpose is to assist people who believe they have Jewish roots and want to reclaim, discover, and restore this heritage. For more than 300 years, the fear of persecution prevented the new Christian Jews from living their lives as children of Israel, and a deep trauma was created in their souls. Now is the time when their descendants are hearing the call to come back home in their hearts, and Abrajim exists to cope with this call. So Abrajim was established in the year 2000, in 30, uh, 31, March 31st of 2000. And on 2012, Abrajin created the first museum of the Inquisition uh, in Brazil. And uh, this is the museum. That's Dr. Saif with Dr. Barry there visiting the museum last September. They were there with us. This, this museum was built in Belo Horizonte, uh, Brazil, where we live. And you can check the website, museudainquisicao.org.br. You know, just take a picture, you can visit later. Uh, so what is the museum about? The museum is everything Abrajim had, we put on display on the museum, and we established uh, uh, research centers for people to research their last names. And... Um, let me show you. Yeah, the museum, the museum, uh, Rabbi Roy, the museum is today recognized as a worldwide recognized um, uh, work. We have visitors every, every day, every week at least, we have visitors from abroad. M more than we have from sometimes local visitors. So we had visitors from Hebrew University, professors from the Hebrew University, professors from uh, Washington University. Two months ago, we had a visit from a Democrat uh, senator called um, James Hendrich, something like this. Uh, he came, an official visit, to visit the museum. We had three times the visits of the Israeli ambassador in Brazil. He came with his... Uh, uh, when we have a tragedy in Brazil, uh, there was a collapsing of a dam in, in, in Belo, in my city, and Israel sent uh, military staff to help. So the military, the general, the commander, they all went to visit the museum. You know, General Golam, this was his name. So let me show you, not only tell about, I want to show you some pictures of the museum so you can know what we have there. So we have many halls in the museum, Hall of Spain, Hall of Portugal, Hall of Brazil, Hall of the Inquisition, Hall of Torture, and um, here we have a copy of the uh, uh, Edict of Expulsion, the Alhambra uh, Edict. We have here um, the uh, paint, we have some original paintings from Picard. We, have some, we bought some original paintings from uh, Goya, some original drawings from Goya and also some Picard. Um, and we, we, because my father spent many years researching in Lisbon about the Inquisition processes, all of the processes are in a place called Tower of Tombo. Tower of Tombo is a place in, in Lisbon, it's a historical place, where all the documents of the Inquisition are stored. So my father began to make friendship and, and make himself acquainted to some scholars and some doctors in the area. And uh, we received as a donation 150 uh, microfilms of uh, original process. And now we are digitalizing all the process so people can read in ancient Portuguese the trials. And, and, and the trials have all the details, you know, what the... Um, what the victim was speaking, what the uh, uh, judge was uh, speaking, everything, all the uh, torture. So we have these microfilms that are being digitalized now. Um, we have an original book from 1623, that's original, and it speaks up in Latin, it speaks about the uh, purity and proof of nobility, 
how a Christian can prove his, um, his blood is pure. Let's say like that. And this book also trains priests, Catholic priests, to identify a Christian that is not full blood, that, that, that has some, you know. So it's a very interesting to read these books in old Latin. My father speaks and reads Latin. No, doesn't speak. He reads Latin. And he's been translated with some assistant, uh, these books. Um, well, let's uh, rush here. So we have a Torah scroll that we bought in Jaffa, in Israel, in an antiquarium. We bought this Torah scroll, and it's a survivor of a pogrom in Toledo, Spain. Uh, in the 1500s, there was a pogrom there, and they were able to save part of the Torah scroll, and we bought it, and now it's on display in our museum, a survival of the Inquisition from Toledo, Spain. It's been uh, there. Uh, it's from 1450. It's from 1450. Yeah. And, uh, and we, we also bought in Israel, you have to understand, that the Inquisition confiscated almost everything. So if you want to buy things, artifacts, from the Inquisition time, you have to go to Israel. Because many of the Sephardic families that were able to go back to Israel, they sold their, their ancient artifacts to um, um, stores. Or, uh, how do you say? Um, antiquity stores, right? You find antiquity stores in Jerusalem, in Tel Aviv, in Jaffa, especially in Jaffa. So we, with the help of Joseph Shulam, we went to, this, to the right place. And we found people, I have to tell you, it's amazing. This artifact here to the left was from Sephardic Italian Jews. Sephardic that went to Italy. Sephardim that went to Italy. They could not light two candles on Shabbat. They could not have any Jewish symbol. So they developed this, this thing here that if you take a look at the symbol itself, you know, it, it's nothing. But the reflection, it's a Magen David. It's a Star of David. So that's, that was the kind of things that they had to, 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 to develop to escape persecution and to keep their faith alive. You understand? So you, we have here an amulet, a Kabbalist text from, um, from the 17th century in Spain. Uh, Sara was the girl that was uh, sick. And she... <laughs> She, they asked some, someone to write a spell against the priests because they believed she was sick because the priest uh, cursed her. So they, they wrote uh, a counter spell on that parchment. And um, it's very interesting. It's very interesting. So we could translate and read that. You can really get into this Fardic uh, 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 atmosphere during the Inquisition. Brothers and sisters, it was terrible. It was terrible. If someone would accuse you, even without any proofs, you would be prosecuted. You know, anything. Oh, I saw that person with new clothes on Friday night. Okay, that's, that's something. Let's prosecute. I saw that person praying a typical Catholic prayer without saying at the end in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's a, a, a reason to prosecute. Anything would be used to prosecute someone. So let's uh, advance here. And we have here original uh, Megillat Ster from the uh, book of Esther from a synagogue in Spain also. And here we have the room of torture, where we did some replicas of the most common uh, uh, machines used by the Portuguese Inquisition. You know, the Portuguese Inquisition was uh, particularly different. The, the, um, the court, and the Verdugo, Verdugo was the one that was uh, executing the sentence. None of the machines could make the person bleed. You can torture, you can uh, stretch, you can burn, but you cannot make the person bleed. You know why? Because on the Catholic way of the, the, 
the Catholic Church, Portuguese Church way of understanding things, only the blood of Christ redeems. So the person could not bleed. The only blood that redeems is Christ. And you have to understand, all of this was done in the name of who? You tell me, in the name of who? When the Jew was there being, being, being accused, when the Jew was there being tortured, he was being tortured in the name of who? What was the banner that was next to him? The banner, I'll tell you, the banner that was next to any person being tortured by the Inquisition was the banner where a lamp is shown next to a cross, next to an olive branch, and there was a verse in Latin. Here is the Lamb of God that redeems the world, that takes out the sin of the world. Who was the sin that was taken out? The Jew. So you have to understand that the, the difficulties that we have today as Messianic Jews, you need to understand the root of this difficulty. It's quite natural to understand. Because our Jewish friends and relatives, when we say that we serve Yeshua, when we say that we are disciple of Yeshua, like that Hazan in the synagogue in New York, when he found out that I'm a disciple of Yeshua, in his mind, I became one with that kind of religion. I became one with this kind of persecution against my people. So it's inconceivable. It's impossible. You're no longer a Jew. You can't be a Jew. You join the enemy. You join the pagan faith that persecuted our people, that killed our people. So I understand where is he coming from because I know this history. Okay, so these are some of the replicas of the instruments. I'm not going to tell you all of it, but um, here's the visit from the Israeli ambassador. He's like 6'5". I mean, he's giant, you know. He, he, his name is... Uh, uh, oh, I forgot his name. It's a, a Bulgarian Jew. Um, Joseph... Uh, Shari, Yosef Shari, something like this. I'm sorry. So he visited the museum and then his uh, successor also visited the museum. This is my father here giving him a special gift. Um, and then we had um, the visit of Benjamin Netanyahu when President Bolsonaro was elected. Netanyahu came for the first time in Brazil and he called leaders of the Jewish community to make a speech in Copacabana Hotel and my father and I were invited because of the museum. So we were there with Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, they didn't let us take pictures with Benjamin Netanyahu, but we, we just registered the moment. It was a very important moment, and we were invited because of the museum, not because of uh, our congregation, but because of the museum, they, were, um, they invited us. So uh, the, the government of Brazil, because of our work, established the 31st of March as not a national holiday, but as a holiday to, in, in honor of the memory of the victims, victims of the Inquisition. So today it's a day that the go Brazilian government recognized. Um, and we, our, our Abrajim is working in partnership with the government of Portugal. As Dr. Seif spoke last night, Portugal and Spain they are making some uh, compensation policy. If you can prove that your ancestor was a Jew that was forced to leave Spain or Portugal because of the Inquisition, if you can prove it, the government will give you Spanish citizenship or Portuguese citizenship. But they demand some proof. So, Abrajim, our association, contacted the uh, Jewish community of Lisbon and we said, you know what, we have a museum here, we have a database, we can help you guys attest those who have Jewish Sephardic ancestry. So the Portuguese government, in partnership with the um, Abrajim, they are recognizing our certificate as valid. So every person that Abrajim issues a certificate, the Portuguese 
the Portuguese Jewish community is certifying and passing on to the government to process citizenship. So like Dr. Saif said, we have more than 1,025, uh, 1,250 people already approved, already with Portuguese citizenship with our help, okay? Um, and the same, uh, we, we, because of our database is more focused on Portugal, we helped only two or three people for Spanish citizenship. And most of the candidates that apply to us, they are uh, Portuguese uh, citizenship. So um, I have to rush up here. So what are we doing in Portugal? Because there are Anusim in Portugal as well. So what are we doing in Portugal? We are visiting synagogues. We're visiting cities with Jewish ancestry. We are talking to mayors. And we are helping uh, people from Portugal also to reconnect to their Jewish ancestry. So we conducted uh, um, conferences in cities in Portugal with some Jewish presence. So that's the mayor of Trancoso, a very Jewish city, medieval city in Portugal. Julio Sarmento is our friend. We had here uh, the, the, the mayor of Castelo de Vida. Castelo de Vida was the city right on the border between Portugal and Spain. There was a, a bridge that they crossed, the Roman bridge, and after they crossed the bridge, they would reach this city in Portugal called Castelo de Vida. We are friends of this mayor from Castelo de Vida, and we encouraged him 20, 20 years ago, we encouraged him to explore more the Jewish heritage of the city. They had nothing 20 years ago. The, the city was poor, the city was empty, the city was in ruins, and we encouraged him to look, there's such a rich Jewish presence here that she, if you want to use that, you can have resources, you can have sponsors from Israel, from the, from the, uh, from the uh, UE, and today, you visit Castelo de Vidi, it's wonderful. They have museums, very high-tech museums. They, they restored the Jewish neighborhood. They restored the ancient synagogue, 500 years old synagogue. They restored the, the today's a museum. When I was there with my father in 2002, I celebrated a, a, a Torah service, a Shaharit Shabbat, in that synagogue where our ancestors celebrated. It was full of trash. It was full of trash. People from the neighbors would, neighbors would to throw trash in this, in this place, in the place where we were. It was smelly. But we, we, we prophesied. We, we, we celebrated Shacharit Shabbat there, you know. And today you go there, there's histories flourishing, and it's amazing. So let me, um, let me just, uh, this is Belmonte, the mayor of Bel Belmonte. Uh, we take tour. Uh, Jewish tour groups to, to Portugal and also to Israel but and we meet with the Anusim in Portugal twice a week twice, uh, twice a year we meet with the Anusim in Portugal in Lisbon, in Porto, in the north in the south, we conduct meetings with all people that are interested in restoring the Jewish roots, we do it every year twice, at least twice a year, my father and I um, and we do researches also in, uh, in Portugal, we can see signs of the Anusim in doorposts. It's quite interesting. We conduct uh, conferences, like I told you. And, uh, and I want to just, just to, to end, I'm, I'm, I'm ready done, but I just want to show you uh, your congregation, your sister congregation in, in Belo Horizonte, okay? Where Dr. Saif was, and I hope you can visit us when you have time. So this is my this is a congregation uh, uh, Harzion in Belo Horizonte. Um, this is the uh, Saturday morning Shabbat morning service, and then we have here the the dance team. That was a, a, a Havdalah service. Um, we have a Sefer Torah. This Sefer Torah we have a one Ashkenazi and one Sephardic, like you guys here. The one the one that we have from. Um, from Sephardic, we use, we use only when you have honorable guests, like Dr. Saif was there, so I, I told them, okay, let's put out the Sephardic Torah scroll. But when we have regular services, we use the Ashkenazi one. Um, 
we conduct international conferences for Christian leaders because we believe that it's essential to work with the church, to work with Christian leaders. It's essential to work with them because if you want to restore your Jewishness, start by restoring the most important mission of a Jew. What is the most important mission of a Jew? What was the mission of the first Jew? Be a blessing to the families of the earth. So we need to reach out for the Christian church. We need to reach out for Christians and teach them against antisemitism. And teach them against replacement theology. And teach them about the, Jew, the Jewish roots of their faith. You see, last month in Brazil, there was a march of 800,000 people with Israeli flags. And people ask, but why? Why Brazil has this connection with, with, with Israel? It's in the blood. If you imagine 20% of Brazilian population having Jewish blood, that's why. It's in the, it's in the soul. It's a, it's a nefesh yehudi. It's in the soul. It's a Jewish soul. You know, the rabbis say that you have a, if you have a dry land, apparently you have nothing. You have just sand, desert. But if you drop water and after some time life begin, begins to flourish, it's a sign that the seed was there all the time. It was only needed some drops of water for that to flourish. That's the Jewish soul. That's the Jewish, the, the soul of the Anusim that lost his her, her heritage. It remained centuries in the dark, but the, but the blood still runs. And it's just, it takes just one sign, one Hebrew. He hears one Hebrew song. He hears the Shema for the first time. He comes here to Baruch Hashem and he sees the Torah scroll. Something happens inside of the person. He cannot explain. She cannot explain. He comes to Rabbi Roy and said, I have something inside of me. I cannot explain. This all seems familiar to me. I cannot know how. Help me, Rabbi. That's the Jewish soul. It was there all the time. And that's the restoration that you and I are part of. And it's an honor and privilege to be part of this, this call. Brothers and sisters, the prophets of Israel would give anything to be alive in such a days as we are. To see Israel being restored. And like Zechariah said in chapter 9, I am with Dr. Saif, with Rabbi Roy, Rabbi Baruch. We are prisoners of hope. I am a prisoner of this hope to see Israel restored once again. And I'm giving my life, like Dr. Saif and other leaders are giving theirs, to see the Negev once again inhabited by Sephardic Jews. I had to finish, so I will just... Uh, we have a local school in Brazil also to teach leaders. No, I'm, I'm, it's, uh, it's uh, less than slides. My wife teaches some Jewish cooking... Uh, she has a Jewish... Jewish cooking school on YouTube. It's called Flavor of Zion. In Portuguese, Sabor de Sion. Flavor of Zion. She has an Instagram account, a YouTube channel. So she, she, brothers, why we do that? Why we do that? Why I have a school? Why I'm teaching Jewish cooking? To restore, to help these people to restore their 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 heritage. Because if they're being rejected in the regular Jewish circles, they will not be rejected here. Here they're welcome. Here we will restore them, making them keep the most important thing that they have, which is Yeshua Mashiach. Here Yeshua is not negotiable. Here Yeshua has a place of honor. Here you can be 100% Jew and 100% a disciple of Yeshua. Like Paul, like Peter, like John, like Yeshua himself, like James. Here we do not compromise. Never compromise Yeshua in your life. It's not worth it. It's not worth it, it's not worth it to be recognized by some Beit Din, by some Jewish institution and ruin your soul. 
And I've been a witness of these tragic cases many times. People that ruin their family, ruin their lives, ruin the lives of their children just to be accepted, just to have a letter, just to have a paper, just to have a certificate. It's not worth it. That's why we, we set up this conference to, to help, to, 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 to convince the Messianic Jewish associations to help the Anusim to restore the Jewishness. So they don't have to go to the Jewish uh, local Orthodox Chabad synagogue to do it. We have, we have so resources to do it. We can do it. We can help them. If they don't, don't recognize your heritage, we do recognize your heritage. We'll help you to recognize, to restore your heritage. That's the vision. That's the vision. I'm sorry, I'm preaching here. I'm, uh, I apologize. I, I, uh, we have, we have, we write books. We write books to educate, to help. Historical books, theological books, Jewish books, children's book. I wrote, uh, I wrote a children's Torah commentary, illustrated, five volumes. It's available to educate like the brother here with the wonderful same vision to educate our children. Each. They don't need to be afraid anymore. They don't need to be afraid anymore. The time of the Inquisition is gone. We have a music ministry that we record Jewish songs in Hebrew and Portuguese and Spanish. We already recorded three albums. I, I gave in the flash drive, I gave the brother there. It has all the music that we recorded. You can uh, make use of it if you want. We were in Israel in 2011 in the Netanya College. Uh, in Miami, they have, a, I don't know if Pastor remembered this occasion, they had a, a conference called World Awakening of the Descendants of the Anusim. They invited my father and I, they invited John Hagee, they invited mo the most famous scholars, and um, it was an interesting conference. But you know what? <laughs> it's a lot of talk. It's a lot of graphics. It's a lot of statistics. But on the practical field, all of those Anusim that were there with their eyes shining, waiting to be, you know, to receive something, some hand, nothing, nothing. They love to talk among themselves about the Anusim, about how great they are, about the rich, how rich their culture is. But who is reaching out the hand to help them? So, uh, what should we expect for the future? I'll tell you. We want to draw the attention of the nations and of Israel to the reality of the Nusim and their historical right to be reintegrated back to the people of Israel. The blood of our forefathers are, is crying out from the ground. And it's crying out for justice. And history never forgets. Men may forget. History, God never forgets. We want justice. We want, to be, we want to be reintegrated. We want Israel to recognize the Anusim and give them right to return to Israel regardless of their faith and without the obligation to convert to Orthodox Judaism. That's our cause. And you know what? They know who you are. They know who Rabbi Roy is. They know who Jeff Seif is. They know who Mateo Zandona is. They know who Tony Arroy. The, the, the Israeli government, they, knows, they know everything. In 2015, I was studying with my family in the Hebrew University. I started the master's there. I got a phone call. I was in the class. Mr. Mateus. This is such and such clerk of Knesset members, such and such. Would you be available to come to the Knesset for an interview? I said, sorry, I, I don't understand. What's, I thought it was a hoax or something like this. Oh, no, it, uh, it's an interview. Aren't you connected to the work of, with the Anusim? He said, yes. Okay, so come this day, that time, that address. My wife remembers. I was shaking. I was, 
I thought that, you know, I thought I was going to be kicked out of, from Israel or something, you know. So I showed up the next day in one of the Knesset uh, buildings, passed through security. I entered the room. There was a table like this with four people seated, four cameras recording, one chair right here, and they told me to sit on the chair, so I sat on the chair facing the four uh, Knesset members, and there was a sign on the table, Mizrad Hagalut, Ministry to Help the Anusim. And we are finding ways to bypass the Orthodox and bring the Anusim back to Israel. <laughs> so we are, collecting, we are collecting testimonies, we are researching people that are already working with this cause, because when the time comes and when the door opens, we want to invite you to come. Our, our great difficulty are the Orthodox now because they, they are imposing a lot of restrictions to the process, but we, we are trying to bypass them and work in conjunction with them to see a common solution. So tell us your story. And I told them, three hours, brothers and sisters, we're all in tape. And when, we, we were, when I, I was done, they came to me and said, keep doing your job. Don't get discouraged. Your time will come. So they know, they know about us. So the, 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 we should pray for a divine intervention in this process of restoration because it needs to be divine. It needs to be guided by God. We believe in God's word and in his promise. Israel will be restored, including the Anusim, and will recognize her Messiah. And as Messianic leaders, how can you help? You can know the history of the Anusim and learn how to identify the true Jewish descendant from the Inquisition. Dr. Seif is an example for me, you know. When I took classes with him in 2000, I would never imagine that he would be fighting for our cause. Never, never. It, because it's not from his environment. Environment. It's, it was something new for him, but he studied. He got experience, and he, now he's an expert. He knows more than I am. And he's influencing much more people than I could. And God is using him to restore the Anusim. And we should pray for him and for Dr. Barry. And you should be aware of the latest developments in the Israeli government regarding the acceptance of the Anusim. Help us to aid Messianic Jewish institutions to find, find ways to recognize the Anusim as Jews. That's why we're here. Because if institutions like the UMJC, like Netivia in Israel, if they could recognize and they could extend the, the arm with open hands and say, come back home. We accept you as, as a Jewish descendant, as a, a, as a Sephardim, you know, welcome, welcome home, welcome back home. We want you to be part of our movement. We would be one step ahead of Israel. Do you understand? We would, he one, we would be one step ahead of Israel. Because right now Israel doesn't know what to do. There's a shock between politics and the Orthodox and the religious party. So they're stuck. And for 50 years they're being like that. So it's time for us Messianic Jews to move forward. Move forward. And that's it. I promise now it's the last day. <laughs> last day, man. This is a special brothers and sisters. Last year, on May the 8th, for the first time, a family, a, 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 me a member of our family, celebrated his bar mitzvah in Jerusalem, in the Wailing Wall, in the Kotel. That's my son over there, Daniel. After hundreds of years of persecution, after the Inquisition tried to shut us down, after the Inquisition tried to erase our memory, to erase our traditions, to erase everything that we had, 
Dafka, you know, by purpose, I, 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 I prayed to God and God opened the doors. And we celebrated a, a bar mitzvah ceremony with more than 45 people in the wailing wall with no shame. Praying in the name of Yeshua, praying out loud in the name of Yeshua, thanking Yeshua for that opportunity because because of him, we were able to be there. And my son, as a, as a Jewish disciple of Yeshua, 100% Jewish, 100% disciple of Yeshua, read from his portion. Behar was his portion. At the wailing wall, at the, at the very, very place that our ancestors used to worship. We were there back again. It was a statement to everybody to hear. We're back home. We're back home. That's our heritage. Nobody will take that from us again. No fear. No trauma. And we put on the tefillin. We prayed. And my father blessed my son. And my, my, my in-laws were there. Rabbis, friends of ours were there. It was, it was very emotional for all of us. And that's the text that we read at the end of the ceremony. I scattered them among the nations. And they were dispersed throughout the countries. For I will take you from the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put you my spirit within you and cause you to walk on my status. And you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. Like Rabbi Baruch read from Obadiah, Vegalut Yerushalayim, Asher Bisfarad, Yershu, Et Areya Negev, and the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Negev, in the Sfarad, will possess the cities of the Negev. Todaraba, thank you, and we look forward to receive you in Brazil. Thank you so much. Sorry for the 20 minutes uh, more. I apologize. No, no, no. Thank, thank you. All the way from Brazil. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Excellent, excellent. Amen. You, you may be seated. But before we go, let his wife come up. Come here. His wife came all the way from Brazil. Come say a few words, please. Is that your worst nightmare? Okay, okay, okay. No, it's okay, it's okay, because... I am so shy. Thank you so much. Thank you for receiving us with uh, such love, and it's it's such a privilege to be here. Yes, it's a lot of work to help men and women and families to restore their Jewishness. So that's what we have been doing since since we were married for 25 years. That's our lives, and uh, it's such a blessing. Thank you. Thank you. I want to tell you and Rabbi Baruch, uh, together with Jeff, everything you saw here, Rabbi, everything that we do, we are at your service. We're here to help. We're here to join forces with you because the time is short and the work is big. So count of us, we are here to help and to add. Can we visit Brazil? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. We will go. We will go to Brazil. You'll cook? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. It was, it was not by accident you married your wonderful wife. Yes. God is merciful. God is merciful. Yes. Yes. And, and Dr. Seifer married Dr. Barry. Thank you so much. I, my wife is from the Canary Island, Spain. And she's a Sephardic Jew. So praise the Lord. De España. We are on the cutting edge of something. The question is not whether God's will will be done. It will be done. It's whether you want to participate in it. And there's something that is opening up that has never opened up in our history. Before, as Messianic Jews, we've been pushed aside by the government of Israel and everything. We're on the side. We're the, we're the orphan child. But something has taken place, an explosion. 
I am so sorry what happened on October 7th. And my heart goes out for both the children of Gaza and, and, and also all the wonderful people that passed. If you would know, we had a, a group from Israel just visit us recently. And because they were here, they accepted Yeshua. When they saw the Buddha, they left the Nova thing because they didn't want to be part of it. And they were saved. Lior has said, because we were here in San Antonio. These were Sephardic Jews. I want to say something. We've, we've been rejected by so many. But something has happened. Since October 7th, the Orthodox rabbi from Austin says, please, come, speak on the Capitol with us. And they're calling us and they're joining in. We need all the Messianic Jews now because no longer are, are the enemies fighting the free Palestine. They're fighting not only the Jews, they're fighting the Messianic Jews. He says, we need to be as one. The Orthodox rabbi from San Antonio called me up. Can you join with us over here in this particular, uh, we're doing a, a protest. We need, we're one now. <gasps> That's never happened, y'all. It's never happened. And though this tragedy took place, the door has been opened. And now we are one with our Jewish community. The Orthodox, the conservative, the, the reformed are now joining in with us. I'm so excited, you guys. Imagine the excitement when, the children, the, when they formed in 1948, what took place. They're in Israel. You're part of this explosion that's going to take place. Thank you for participating. Dr. Seif and Barry, thank you so much. Rabbi Baruch, he's done such a great job on this conference. Thank you, Rabbi Baruch. <laughs> Rabbi Baruch, come on. Thank you, Rabbi Roy. And also, there's just so many people who are, who are not, who are not always thanked from uh, that. Go unnoticed. I want to make sure they're they're not unnoticed from uh, Lindy Levy, who her family, by the way, are descendants of Sephardic pirate Sephardic pirates that lived in Jamaica. So Sephardic. So if you ever hear her go, if you ever see her going, ah, you know where that's from. <laughs> Right. So that's but she keeps this place running. She keeps it for lack for no pun. intended. Well, I guess now pun intended. She runs a tight ship here, <laughs> keeping everything here. So she she's a, she's a descendant of Sephardic, uh, Sephardic Jamaican pirates. The bullies are uh, also work tirelessly. I don't know how they do it. I don't know where they get that in, uh, that energy from. I just want to get. She and saying that she's going a little crazy with that. She, she, they do wonderful. The Hoffmans as well from hosting uh, Havdalas and uh, very and again we're going to host, but this time we're going to be having a, ho a host uh, the Havdala here uh, tonight. Just a reminder uh, to to the Ark to building the Ark. It's been really wonderful. And again, thank you to Israel Yahu Israelia for helping us secure that. Sephardic, uh, that Sephardic Torah from Yerushalayim, it is, that's a, it's a pretty massive Torah, if you ever come and see it, and you know, one of these days, um, actually, I, did, I probably, maybe even today, during the conference, we'll open it up so you could uh, look at it, we already had our Hakam uh, Sefer Torah already, but it is, it's, it's just been a real blessing, and we, again, we have so many people here, um, we have people I encourage you to stay. It's going to be hard. If you can make it through all five, I think, hours of these lightning rounds, you'll get a T-shirt that says, I listened to nine rabbis lecture, and all I got was this T-shirt. <laughs> and so, so you, you get that, and then <laughs> if you can make it through... Wow, you are a trooper if you can make it through this. But there's a lot. I think we're gonna begin. We're gonna con, we're gonna have the live stream going on. So, right. I'm sorry. Not during lunch, but then afterwards we're gonna live stream again. So if you if you really wanna uh, listen to Rabbi Kolner speak, but you're you know you're you know you have to step out a little bit, you could. Don't step out for his. He is a ba bad example. If you want to, 
if, I'll use me, if I'm talking and you're like, oh, not right now, just not today, then you could go back, listen to it another day when you're feeling a little bit better, right? So you could do that. So we're going to have the live stream too. I encourage you to be here in person. Again, you do not have to pay to listen. Listening's free. The barbecue costs money though. So that's why, you, so we got that. We have, we're going to have some food out, uh, out here. It's getting set up. It's, again, everything's kosher style. We don't have, we, we didn't charge you guys enough money to have a mashkiach to look over to make sure everything is, is halakhically kosher. It's, it's biblically kosher though. So, uh, so you should be fine there. There's no pork. There's no, no ham, nothing like that. And it's just, it's wonderful. Again, tomorrow we have a screening at 930 here about the hidden Jews of the Southwest. And then we're a joint uh, service with our, uh, with our sister congregation. Okay, don't forget, again, Havdalah tonight. If you want to join us, if you step out, come back for the Havdalah, please join us together. And that'll be wonderful. Yes, Mr. Okay, wonderful. If you have any questions about the Sephardic school, about the, the B'nai Anasim school, we have that, uh, that Dan Como has. You could go up there. Again, we're, they're going to try to get this funded by the state. And we also have, uh, again, wonderful. There's so many brains to pick up. And I'll just say right now, even right now, I'm not going to say any names because I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't ask their permission to say, say any names. But there are, in addition to the speakers up here, there are people who are walking around who are scholars of a very high caliber and you won't even know it you might just see some guy walking around in the corner just kind of looking at the ceiling he's probably really smart all right so so if you see that you can uh we have and we we do have different scholars from uh from the mgti we have uh uh I'm not, I did, again, I didn't ask permission, so I'm not going to say the name. We have a professor from the University of Texas at Austin, uh, and so I, uh, you'll know who it is. It might, it might be that guy right there, or it might be that lady right there, so you'll know who it'll be. So I'm not going to say, but, so we have a lot of people here, and it's going to be really wonderful. Stick around, if, most of all today, if you can. Tomorrow is going to be more, as, as when... When it says, uh, uh, not by might, no, by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And this is something that has been on my heart. We pray for the leadership to have sechel, to have that, that, that tact and that knowledge of how to go forward. Politicians don't always have that. We need to pray that they do going forward. And again, that, that big man, that mandamiento, that big commandment to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We're going to end with Hatikva, and does anyone, okay, we're, we're just going to end with uh, Hatikva. Do we have the words by any chance? I don't know if we have the words. If not, we'll just hope that you know it. Okay, so we'll just stand up, and we're praying. Hatikva means the hope. It's the, we're praying for the hope of, of Am Yisrael, of the people of Israel, and for the land of Israel, and not just for the physical safety, but their spiritual safety as well. Does anyone sing better than me for this? <laughs> Okay, we'll sing all together. I'll sing without the, the mic.
We're going to have Will to say the Birkat Khanim. So if we, you, some people put a, a talit over. If you want to do that, you could do that. If not, you could just bow your head for the Birkat Khanim. Yivrecha Adonai Vaishmarecha Yaher Adonai Panavelecha Vichuneka Yisa Adonai Panavelecha Vichuneka Lecha Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.